peace, you might sacrifice some Asian peace synthesis. Another reason is that in metabolically active mitochondria, there are co-transport systems, and here are a couple, which have to tap into the proto-motive force as well. And when you use energy from the proto-motive force for another purpose, you cannot use it for ATP synthesis anymore. So this is why we don't get to the 36 ATP, or, or not even the 41 ATP, theoretically get according to my rough gravity envelope calculation. Okay, so leaf channels and the needs to drive co-transport are reasons why the ATP synthesis is not what you predict if you just look at how steep a magnetic potential we have at that point. Okay. A very important point to remember also is that electron transport will only occur if there are coenzymes that can donate electrons. And these coenzymes need to be charged in the Craig cycle. And in uh, the matrix by the pyruvate dehydrogenase, so PDH, pyruvate dehydrogenase. So those NADH need to be formed they need to be formed from NAD plus. But the matrix enzymes of the Krebs cycle and pyruvate dehydrogenase require that pyruvate. So that needs to be available from the cytosol. Pyruvate is formed in glycolysis in response to a drop in the ATP over ADP ratio. So when there's a need for ATP because you're doing work, in using of ATP, glycosis picks up, and you start this whole process of charging your coenzymes, which then feed into the electrical transport chain. So everything is coupled. If you are not doing cellular work and utilizing your ATP, your mitochondria are not pumping protons and are not making ATP. Everything is coupled. If you take the coupling away and things stop. So if you separate steps of the process, then you might have to provide something. For instance, if we once again isolate mitochondria, that means there's no cytosol. And we're measuring oxygen consumption here, which we can measure. So when do we see the best sustained oxygen consumption? We're giving a couple of options here. So if we give ADP and inorganic phosphate, that is a good idea. But if we give glucose as a substrate, that won't do anything because glucose, if we isolate the mitochondria away from the cytosol, is not broken down to pyruvate. So if we go to option two, it's better because there we give ADP and inorganic phosphate and pyruvate. So pyruvate is a substrate. The electron transport chain has something to start with. There's ADP and PI. There's a reason to synthesize ADP and to take away the proton gradient. So it's not so steep. So the electron transport chain tries to pump it back up. Ultimately, that leads to the consumption of oxygen. So we can do that. But pretty soon, with this amount of ADP and inorganic phosphate, everything is converted to ATP. So the system will stop. So we can do a little bit better. If we add ADP and inorganic phosphate, add pyruvate, but also add this enzyme hexokinase, and we add glucose. Now here's the trick. If we add hexokinase and glucose, the hexokinase will actually consume ATP, forming ADP. So hexokinase in this system mimics cellular work. The mitochondrial will not consume oxygen if there's no need to generate, to regenerate ATP from ADP. Now we give it a reason. So in free, we will get a very high sustained rate of oxygen consumption. 
3 would be better than 4, because since we're putting our inorganic phosphate on the glucose, forming glucose 6-phosphate, we need to also give the inorganic phosphate back. So 3 is better than 4 because it also has inorganic phosphate. I'd like you to understand this question. It gets to the fundamental point of how everything in metabolism is coupled. I like this one. It's my favorite. One final point about these proton gradients. Here we have our mitochondrion, where the F1 part sits in the matrix. There's our electron transport chain here, pumps protons out, we get a membrane potential. Virtually the same system functions in bacteria. They use their inner membrane. They pump protons out, they have the same ATP synthase. It functions in the same way. But if you look at chloroplasts or photosynthetic bacteria, they have internal membranes. They also generate a proton gradient, but it's not driven by the oxidation of reduced coenzymes. It's driven by light. But that proton gradient is still formed. The protons are removed, moved away from what we can consider the cytoplasmic compartment. They can move back through the same ATP synthase, generating ATP. The system of chemical osmosis is very general. The proton gradient in some systems is driven by oxidation reduction of coenzymes in other systems by light. I really like you to understand that this is a very important general mechanism. In fact, we're going to see that the whole system of respiration is derived from photosynthesis. By the loss of the photosystems, but keeping part of the electrical transport chain and adding to it. So we'll see that in photosynthesis, which you very well know. How are we doing, class? How are you doing? We're going to be fine. Okay, we'll look at photosynthesis. Probably for the second exam, we'll also have a look at the microfilaments. Okay, you've seen this view before. What happens on the planet? Well, life energy drives the formation of organic molecules. It uses electrons in water. That energy is boosted up to form organic molecules, such as carbohydrates. That happens in photosynthesizers. As an ATP intermediate to store energy and an NADP, the P is important there, in this build-up reaction, anabolic pathway. Organic molecules are broken down by respiratory organisms, which is virtually everybody, including the plants. Plants respire. And the mitochondrial is important. The NADH is the important coenzyme there. Generate ATP. Where does photosynthesis occur? Photosynthesis occurs in several types of green organisms, so eukaryotic algae and higher plants, as well as the green, uh, the blue green bacteria, known as the cyanobacteria, which are amongst the most ancient life forms on the planet. They are of the coast of, I guess, West, Western Australia, there are these uh, fossils, which are thought to be over two billion years old, cyanobacteria. In there. Very old. So these organisms do photosynthesis, and in my class, photosynthesis means carbon fixation, the incorporation of CO2 into organic molecules driven by light. We're mainly going to consider the process in plants. Plants are green, especially in their leaves. In their leaves, we have cells. There are our metaphyl cells here, different kinds. In those cells, there are chloroplasts. That's the main site of photosynthesis, the site of photosynthesis. There are also veins here. 
vessels, and these vessels serve for more transport, so getting more to the leaf, and for sugar export, that's the flowing vessels. I mention that now because it will come become important a little bit later in the class. Correct. How does photosynthesis work? CO2 is captured under the influence of light energy to form carbohydrates. CH2O is the general formula of carbohydrate. Then there's water that's used and oxygen that is produced as a byproduct. The electrons come from water to reduce the carbon in CO2. Oxygen is the byproduct. So the electrons in water have low energy, using light energy to increase that energy level so they can be used to become high energy electron volts in sugars. So CO2 provides the carbon and some of the oxygen in the carbohydrate. Water provides the electrons and as a byproduct the hydrogen that grows in. And oxygen is just a byproduct, originally toxic to life. But life has to learn to deal with this oxygen. It's thought that photosynthesis is a very old process on the planet. Something like two and a half to three billion years old. The history of life on the planet. The planet might be four to five billion years old, give or take half a billion. Life might be three and a half to four billion years old, give or take half a billion. Photosynthesis is early in that development of life. It's a very huge invention. Respiration came much later. Makes sense because I needed the oxygen for respiration. For the synthesis to produce the oxygen. Okay. How does photosynthesis work? I have two major parts, which we call the light reactions and the Kelvin cycle. The Kelvin cycle is also sometimes called the dark reaction. I think that's a bad name. Better call it the Kelvin cycle because the Kelvin cycle and the light reactions happen at the same time. This is because the two processes are coupled. How are they coupled? In the light reactions, light energy is, is captured. This occurs in the finer parts of the chloroplast. And this leads to the formation of reduced NADP plus, so NADPH and a proton, as well as ATP. And these coenzymes are consumed at the same time in the Kelvin cycle. So, the Kelvin cycle needs to provide the NADP plus and ADP for the light reactions, and the light reactions provide the NADPH and the ATP for the Kelvin cycle. They're coupled. They're coupled. It cannot be written big enough. All right. Let's look at the light reactions first. The light reactions occur in the fiber parts of plant chloroplasts. These are the fiber parts. Fiber part means sac-like structure. They are enclosed structures, they are closed membrane systems. And we can think of the lumen of the fiber parts as the outside of the cell, the outside like compartment. In other words, something where we can pump protons to. All right, now, in the fiber membrane, there are the photosystems, and there's an electron transport chain, as we will see. What is a really huge invention is to use electrons from water in order to reduce NADP plus to form NADPH. What is a smaller trick of photosynthesis is to at the same time also form ATP and use light energy for that process. Right. Let's first look at the overview, then we'll look at the details. Here we have a view of the fiber part membrane. On the outside here we would have the stroma, on the inside we call it the lumen. What happens is that under the influence of light, 
we have photosystems that drive electrons through electron transport chain and that leads to the generation of a proton gradient. Protons accumulate in the lumen. Then the protons can later flow back through the ATP synthase that is the exact same type of ATP synthase that works in respiration. People have done experiments where they have taken subunits for photosynthetic ATP synthase, put it in bacteria that respire, and it still works. It's the same enzyme. At the same time that protons are pumped, electrons are stolen from water, which is very difficult, stolen from the oxygen and water, and ultimately donated to NADP plus to form NADPH. And the NADP plus reduction allows for the reductive power to later reduce CO2. The whole mechanism of ATP synthesis is the same as in mitochondria. In order to do all of this, the big problem is that the energy in a photon is relatively low. So as biologists, we can take physics and we can use it to our advantage. We can look at light as waves, if you like. We can look at light as particles. And a particle of light is a photon. And if you think about the energy that's in a photon, it's directly related to the wavelength of the light. There are photons with high energy, but their interactions with organic matter are destructive. So they cannot be used. Only particles of light that are visible to us interact with organic matter in some kind of a productive way. That's why we can also see them. But the energy in a single photon is not enough to reduce NADPH starting with water. Two photons are enough, and that's why there are two photosystems in a series. And I'll leave you with that idea, and we'll talk more about this on Friday.